afternoon, everybody. I um, really also want to join uh, my fellow panelists in thanking Dana, Brenda, and the Center for Sexual Diversity Studies for the kind <coughs> invitation to speak with you today, and also um, to my, my panelists, in particular Dana Luciano and Mel Chen, for inviting me along for the Queer and Humanist ride. Um, <laughs> I was so uh, disappointed to have had to miss the seminar, uh, and I hope that um, some of the spirit of what happened yesterday will make its way into the discussion, as Dana mentioned at the beginning. Appropriately enough, non-human forces, you know, winter storm kept me from the seminar, and I kept trying to tell the storm, don't you know I'm trying to get to Canada to speak on your behalf? <laughs> but the storm was unperturbed. So um, this is, um, for a panel on new directions, this, uh, this work is, is not exactly a new direction, but new, new work that's trying to complete um, a book on, on fabulation and is in particular thinking about uh, some of the connections between, or really, I was thinking just now, it's about how to think about new media while taking the body as the original medium. Um, and uh, it's also inspired in ways that maybe can come out in conversation uh, uh, by the work of Denise Fajira da Silva, uh, who is inviting us to think about hacking the color line um, and hacking the patriarchal form. And so by the end of it, um, there should be some material on digital code switching, uh, black data, and black capta. Having said that, um, I have some gifts in my presentation which may or may not play, <laughs> uh, but I think it might be clear by the end of the uh, presentation that we have to embrace the technological glitch as very much in the spirit of the, um, of the talk. Okay, so with that, let me dive in. At the end of a... Um, at the end of a GOY performance in which I had been conscripted to play what I took to be the role of father, I went up to the man who had been tasked with the role of mother to ask what his experience had been. I was curious about the event we had just been present for as audience participants, an event that seemed to include elements of both a possession and a rebirthing ritual. Over the duration of the piece, which lasted less than an hour, the artist had transformed before us into one of his performance personae, or what, after Yuri McMillan, we might want to call embodied avatars. Kitchen Steve. Kitchen Steve had welcomed us, the audience, into his home. This home was not a kitchen, exactly, but a sound and light installation in Brooklyn entitled Den. Over the course of the ensuing performance by Kitchen Steve, who is a vocalist and keyboardist, Two audience members were given particular roles to play in his man cave. I was handed a spotlight and a cardboard spear with which to stand symbolic guard, while Kitchen Steve crawled up into the arms of a second audience member, pulled up his sweater, and pawed at his bare chest with infantile demand. How, I asked this audience member after the performance, had it been? <laughs> the mother answered that his part had not struck him as an intrusion onto his personal space, as I had supposed, but rather as a physical test of the endurance of holding. It had taken a surprising amount of upper body strength, he told me, to carry Kitchen Steve. And in bearing Steve up, the mother added, he realized he was also bearing up the memory of his own infant self with the strength of his own mother. In incarnating this strange being named Kitchen Steve, Wyatt had staged what I would call an intransitive memory for this audience member. This performed and embodied memory was not one that linked him to his parent in a normative chain of filial obligation, much less in a familiar psychoanalytic drama of Oedipal complexity. Instead, it repeated the mothering habitus across genders and generations, moving it from personal history to performative fiction, and revealing the subtle fault line within the speculative imagination that the philosopher Henri Bergson called fabulation. Fabulation, Bergson wrote, was the myth-making function at the heart of the imaginative faculty, an atavistic holdover from a more primal mode of perception that he once even termed a virtual instinct. 
In more contemporary theoretical terms, we may conceive of this quote unquote virtual instinct as a virtual drive, or better, a drive for the virtual. This drive produces doubles and alters that stage what is incommunicable and indeed improper to the subject as its shadow self. And its function in art and performance helps us grasp, grasp exactly why the virtual and the imaginary remain such vexed and important sites for the reproduction of the racial nomos. Geo Wyeth is a musician and artist whose work is haunted by a range of specters, past and present, as intimate as members of his family and as remote as a brother from another planet. As each one appears, glistens, and then dissipates, he or she leaves behind vivid, if fragmentary, traces in the memory and in the world. I have been attending Wyeth's performances over much of the last decade, but I've only now begun to find words for what I have seen, heard, and felt there. Only recently has academic storytelling, or critical fabulation, seemed an adequate means with which to arrange those fragments back into something like a verbal silhouette or ekphrasis. In drawing this textual portrait of the artist as a young man, I am conscious of both the intimacy and the distance that Wyeth takes to the identity categories to which he is assigned as a black, American, and transgender artist. Through his works in many media, from soulful bluesy singing to cacophonic arrangements of physical and digital detritus, Wyeth responds to these assignments of race, sexuality, and gender with what Ralph Ellison would call antagonistic cooperation. This antagonistic cooperation is necessary insofar as the story of the nation conceived in settler colonialism and chattel slavery is held in the blood and bound up with every gesture of we, its lesser children. To perform intransitive memories, memories that do not pass on in the codified rituals of collective memory, is to take what Burke Brecht called the fable of the national story and to tell it otherwise. Gathering up the mess that is left around in the wake of the laborious and violent effort to build a human and rights-bearing civil subject, Wyeth's cooperative antagonism to the terms of racial order and compulsory gender is a kind of queer inhumanism. If we grant that phrase a Lacanian inflection as pointing to a beyond of love and recognition, an inhuman location that is, quote, in you more than you, unquote. It is this inner, outer, beyond to the human, the invaginative fold identified by Fred Moten, but also the uncanny gestalt at the scene of the human's decomposition, in which the sum is always other than the parts, that the intransitive memories of G.O. Wyeth's performances repeatedly point us to. The unnamed protagonist of Invisible Man most epitomizes this Ellisonian antagonistic cooperation, I would suggest, in those scenes of the novel where he is suddenly seized with a force of eloquence. And here there's actually an unexpected resonance with what Mel was just saying now about the agitation of protest, right? Uh, suddenly seized with a force of eloquence and steps outside his ordinary self to both rebuke and transfigure his audience with something that might be called charisma but which could be better thought of, I again suggest, as a, an inhumanist possession. That is to say, where the charismatic leader is a continuously modulated presence in the community, modeled within the African American tradition, above all on the pastor, as Erica Edwards has written. The spirit of eloquence that temporarily possesses the protagonist seems less like that of a pastor and more like that of a daemon one might go to a pastor or priest to exercise. When he is so inflamed, Ellison's protagonist reminds me of Gia Wyeth in the role of Kitchen Steve, or Novice Theory, or especially H.W. Claba, to name just three of the inspirited persona that Wyeth has over the course of the years drawn down into his body. These persona or avatars only appear in the flesh upon ritualized invocation and for a short duration. But for the period they are our volatile company, they transfigure not only the artist, but also his audience. 
They do not seem available, however, to be reliably or regularly called upon in scholarship, nor does there seem to be a reliable photographic likeness of any of them to which one can point to in their absence, in a manner that underscores the link between blackness and redaction that recent black feminist theorists like Simone Brown and Christina Sharp have pointed us to. I believe that what we encounter in Gia Wyatt's performances uh, is an instance of the non-representation of blackness or the non-representability of blackness. This is of course, this of course has everything to do with the rememory Toni Morrison writes of in Beloved, in which the trauma of the racial past is, quote, not a story to pass on, unquote. This untold or untellable story, which I am figuring here as an intransitive memory, a memory that acts without taking a direct object, infuses the performative strategies in Wyeth's work that increasingly aim for nothing less than a kind of counterconduct to the normative compliance with homonationalist strictures uh, that is increasingly demanded of queer and trans subjects. Eloquence in these performances takes on the force of an almost impersonal will, a possession that is dispossessive of the subject's proper bearing, habitus, and grounding in the world. The appearances of Kitchen Steve, H.W. Claba, and other more famous ghosts, such as those of Michael Jackson and Joan Rivers, uh, both who have been reanimated by Wyatt. There's something very funny, actually, about many of these performances, as well as spooky. Uh, each take on a kind of counter-pastoral power, unsettling and ungrounding the audience. After any such performance of non-representation, we are left not with an enduring positive image of a black transgender identity, but rather with a range of unruly and unreliable residue that we can call after Jose Esteban Munoz, queer ephemera. The queerest ephemera from Kitchen Steve's performance seem to be a pair of sunglasses I have seen Kitchen Steve wear at each of his public appearances. <coughs> These glasses are made out of cardboard and thus really act more as blinders than spectacles. Um, and on the exterior surface of one lens uh, is a kooky eyeball. We do not need to look any further than John Sayles' classic 1984 film, Brother from Another Planet, to grasp the significance of this eyeball. In this important and somewhat overlooked film, a space alien lands in New York City and must somehow adapt to a contemporary society structured in racial and class dominance. The unspeaking alien is to all appearances a black man and as such naturally makes his way to Harlem where a group of men in a bar accept him as a brother and connect him to a social worker who finds a place for him to stay with a local single mother. After discovering his talent for fixing machines simply by, simply by touching them, the brother from another planet uneasily finds his place in the informal economy until two men in black, one portrayed by the white director of the film, Sales himself, appear in the door of the bar looking for him. The film then transitions into a fugitive slave narrative as the black alien flees the white alien slave catchers using a remarkable range of unexpected abilities, perhaps the most remarkable of which is the ability to remove his right eye and leave it outside his body as a recording device he can later reinsert and watch footage from. Prefiguring contemporary forms of black counter surveillance, or I think using Simone uh, Lee's term, surveillance, um, from camera phone footage of acts of police brutality uh, to the ongoing coordination of Black Lives Matter and other social movements on Twitter, the brother's removable eye serves as a reminder that the uncanny emanation that appears in our midst is not just performing for us but is also a sensitive device for storing up sensations, feelings, and memories. In Deleuzian parlance recently rearticulated through the work of Denise da Silva, what I believe the eye shows us is that the persona is both affecting and affected, and it is affecting precisely because it is affected. Much as the crash landing of the alien and brother from another planet has the effect of representing him as an uninvited guest who appears to hold his community hostage to his inarticulable need. The power of Kitchen Steve in relation to the audience members who were recruited into participating as quasi-parental figures 
was not of the nature we might call informed consent, but we might rather call infinite need or uh, unpayable debt, to use the latest uh, uh, formulation from De Silva. Charismatic and beguiling though he may be, Kitchen Steve responds with antagonistic cooperation to the expectation that we can bear what he brings. As the mother in Den performance said to me, bearing Steve's weight draws out from him a secret reserve of strength that is also an infinite debt. It is not to our individual subjectivity, in other words, but to the inhumanist and subjectless critique of our infinite debt that the blackness of being appeals to. The summoned spirit is bound to appear, as Huey Copeland might say, but he is not bound in a transitive relation of mutual recognition or intersubjectivity. More nearly, he is entangled with us in a paradoxical manner Munoz termed the communism of the incommensurate, that is to say, a shared or non-individual being that we access only on condition of our acknowledging that we are dispossessed by it. Wyeth performs intransitive memories across a range of his work, and his 2014 video installation, Quarter, provides a particularly good example. Through post-secular rituals of possession, Wyeth seeks to dispossess himself and his audiences of the inherited trauma of the racial past. Such an exorcism produces a performing subject that looks nothing like the post-racial liberal individual, free to choose their own history and destiny. In the stead of progressive narratives of gradual overcoming of the pernicious myths of race and racism, but Wyeth employs embodied channeling and self-transfiguration to catalyze a different and more difficult relation to the past. Quarter responds to the silenced historical origins of American gynecology, specifically the story of the so-called father of women's medicine, J. Marion Sims. Sims is well known for pioneering reparative surgeries on the postpartum injuries suffered by enslaved women. That he developed his techniques by repeatedly operating on enslaved women in the antebellum South without anesthesia is part of the established historical record that is often sidestepped or minimized. Sims's surgeries indeed are an early instance of the unfolding biopolitical apparatus of medical apartheid, the process by which the false separation of the races is at once transgressed and established by the medical sciences. Sims's record is important to dwell upon insofar as it renders the transitivity of the racial past to both black and white subjects impossible to ignore. The techniques he developed on enslaved women in the US South were subsequently performed on aristocratic white subjects as far away as Europe. Much of the expropriated wealth of enslaved labor is a transitive property of contemporary whiteness. The biopolitical capacities of modern gynecology can be said to depend upon the sex and race traumas Sims visited upon his subjects. Equally inspired by Adrian Piper and by the TV show Unsolved Mysteries, oh, I guess it is working, okay, uh, the mythic beings and eerie scenarios of Quarter repeatedly suggest that collective memory is a fruitful site of imaginative invention. In so spinning off fantastic persona from traumatic, traumatic histories, Wyeth is, by his own reckoning, seeing, seeking to do something different from telling the tale over and over again in the same way. As he told me, I don't have this intention, it's a quote, I don't have this intention of creating a counter-narrative to the trauma that these women have experienced. But I longed for an explanation of how these kinds of things happened. The pain and trauma that these people experienced to me is just a horrible fact that continues. I almost don't want to put the camera on that because it's not mine. It's something that is a part of me, but it's not. Here, words trail off before Wyeth continues as he contemplates the queer inhumanist trace of that which is in him more than him, before going on to tell me that quarter it is, and again I quote, more a personal reckoning with my own history, but trying to do it in a way that pulls me away from this larger narrative. For me, the narrative is already there. I see it everywhere. You go down south, it's everywhere. This narrative is with us. We don't need to spend all this time belaboring it and telling the tale over and over again in the same way. There are ways that we can pull out Pull, pull at the mundane quality of our everyday life to find this inheritance, this narrative. 
and that could be more transform transformative and contemporary, and actually more haunting. Deeper reminders of how close this is, and that makes room in some way for joy, and makes room for the future, and makes room for laughing in some way at the absurdity of all this, this deluge of inherited structures." Unquote. In this quote, Wyeth gives us a glimpse at the working process behind the construction of what I am, have been calling his uh, performances of intransitive memory. Encountering the narrative that he insists is always already available, he thus stages a relationship to the past that Saidiya Hartman calls critical fabulation. We see such a performance in Wyeth's performances of a figure he calls the shard of light, which can be thought of as a composite portrait of the enslaved victims of his uh, ancestors' surgeries. Somehow there's a paragraph that I omitted from this version of the talk. Uh, Geo Wyeth is, is a lineal descendant of J. Marion Sims, and so he, he grew up with a bust of Sims in his family's uh, apartment. Um, so his, his ancestor. The shard of light shares with Kitchen Steve and H.W. Claba elements of fact and fiction, human and extraterrestrial, deep seriousness, and a laughter fit to kill. It is a performance that disrupts the expectation that Wyeth be either loyal or disloyal to the family history that proffers up to him Sims's tainted legacy as a vexed inheritance. Mixed race subjects often confront this dilemma of what to do with racist ancestors. But as I argued in the Amalgamation Waltz, it is one of the most potent ruses of racialist reasoning to persuade us that this dilemma is one that belongs to mixed race subjects alone. But if Wyatt's performances of intransitive memory interrupts the progressive telos of developmental time and hybrid futures, what space does that open up for anti-normative critique? I'll skip forward a little bit to get to the end. Uh, maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, it is this antagonistic cooperation with the representational obligation to appear in the flesh and on cue that I think Yuri McMillan is after when, in an important new book, he describes the persona of black feminist performance art as consisting of embodied avatars. Drawing on the Vedic meaning of the term avatar, which refers to an earthly incarnation or emanation of a deity, Macmillan uh, invites us to push past the meaning the term has acquired in digital culture, in which it is a name for the face or full body portraits with which individual computer users may navigate div digital spaces, such as video games, websites, and online message boards. Here, in closing, is Kitchen Steve's digital avatar, which true to the spirit of conjuration, may or may not choose to animate in this setting. It appears to be animating today. <laughs> Whether or not it does here and now, what this animated loop bespeaks in its stuttering repetition is the fright of a jester that is discovered to be the ghost in the machine, the glitch in the system, the blackness of non-representation that brings the representational economy to a momentary halt. The digital avatar of Kitchen Steve also suggests a difference between the affectable body of the fugitive alien in Brother from Another Planet and the contemporary idea of an avatar as a personal representative, one who can be exposed, unveiled, or spooked by an act of prestidigitation. We are all familiar, if nowhere else than from hip hop culture, with the series of names and mercurial persona through which many black musicians and performers take their fans and their haters as they develop and change in front of the public gaze. We are increasingly familiar with the demand, not, the, um, uh, uh, not only of the imperative of so-called transparency online, in which the policing of identity and identifiability is held to be the basis, not only of state security, but even certain styles of insurgent politics as well. Identity is held to be the basis of trust, dissimulation, a token of menace. Taking a kooky animated uh, gif, gif, <laughs> gif, right? uh, uh, gif as one's online avatar seems to be the artist's way of saying, now you see me, now you don't. It also seems to be a way of saying, catch me if you can. And lastly, it may suggest, like the alien eyeball, an ephemeral album, emblem of black counter surveillance. Thank you. Thank you.